Good afternoon. This is Richard Shu, host of Shoe Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm very pleased and honored to have as my guest Robert Cialdini. He's an author, speaker, and his most famous book is um, Influence, uh, Pers- The Psychology of Persuasion. Robert, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Richard. I'm glad to be with you. So, Robert, let me start by asking you about that book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. Obviously, an iconic book. Um, I read it many, many years ago and you know, think highly of it. I know Charlie Munger is a big fan of your book and mentions it all the time. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you, um, you know, stumbled onto those original theories and how that book came together. Well, I, I'm an influence researcher. I study persuasion. And um, it seemed to me that studying it in the laboratory was giving me only partial answers to what was powerful to influence people in the everyday influence wars <laughs> that we're involved in. Uh, uh, and so uh, it, it also occurred to me that there were a set of professions whose business it is to get others to say yes to them, salespeople, ma- uh, uh, marketers, advertisers, recruiters, fundraisers, and so on. So I began to um, infiltrate their training programs un, uh uh, incognito, actually, that I was uh, uh, I was not recognized as uh, a university professor, but I wanted to learn from the inside what the most successful influence practitioners did to move people in their direction across all those various kinds of industries. And what I found was just six universal principles of influence uh, that they all seem to employ to produce assent. Now, what made you even interested in something like influence? It seems very vague and nebulous. Like, why were you even interested in that? All my life, I've been a sucker. <laughs> I've always been a pushover for the appeals of various sales uh, operators or fundraisers who would come to my door, and and I would purchase things I didn't really need. I would contribute to causes I didn't know about, and afterward, I would stand in kind of mystified. Um, awe of what had just happened. And it seemed to me in reflection that it wasn't the merits of the thing that had driven me to assent. It was the delivery of the merits. Interesting. And that was worth studying, Um, not just for reasons of self-defense, but uh, for reasons of uh, academic and intellectual interest. Huh. Now, the, how long, how did you, was it hard coming up with the six, I know you have the six key principles influence in your original book. Was it hard putting that, coming that together or did it seem, was it pretty obvious once you started doing it? Tell me how difficult that was to figure that out. It wasn't, ob- it wasn't difficult at all uh, because what I was doing was comparing what I was being instructed to do to get to yes across the widest range of influence professions. And most idiosyncratic things, those things that worked only in particular industries or regions or on particular populations, they just fell away. Hmm. But there were only six things that were there uh, and surfaced regularly wherever people we're making a profit at getting others to say yes. Mm-hmm. Now, of the six key principles, um, which I know are reciprocity, commitment and consistency, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity, which one is actually – how do you, how would you actually rank those or, or do you think they're all equally strong? It depends on the situation, of course. And let me answer that in two ways. One is to kind of uh, evade the question and the other is to um, – uh, perhaps expand on it. The the evasion has to do with um, a research program that one of my colleagues, a marketing professor, um, uh, undertook for about four years. It was to find the single most effective influence tactic, hmm. the one that across the widest range of situations and circumstances and populations uh, worked most uh, effectively. Hmm. And I saw him at a conference a while ago. He caught me by the elbow. He said, Bob, I found it. I found the single most effective influence tactic. 
it is not to have a single influence tactic. <laughs> because the circumstances dictate which principle is going to be most powerful there. Um, and uh, and uh, so that's the way I guess I would respond is that it, it depends on the circumstances. It's it's a fool's errand to try to find, he found a fool's errand to try to find found the single most effective strength. Uh, it's best to always um, uh, modulate your approach to the circumstances of the setting and the and the recipient of your message. The second way I'll respond is to say, however, things have changed recently in terms of which of the principles is most available to us now to move people in our direction. And by far, it has become the principle of social proof, the idea that if a lot of other people like us have have done something or are doing something, it's probably a good thing for us to do as well. They've beta tested it for us. There's this great study that I like to cite from Beijing, which shows that when restaurant managers simply starred certain items on their menu uh, to indicate one of our most popular dishes, each one immediately became 13 to 20 percent more popular mm. simply by pointing to the fact that a lot of others like mm. you who've sat in this restaurant mm. have have chosen this and that's a good good steer to uh, to success mm. Interesting. and um, and I'm going to uh, suggest that um, because of the internet, we now have access to the voices and the counsel and the experiences of many, many more people than we've ever had before. And so one thing that individuals choose, use to choose correctly is the experiences of others, which they can now get on various user sites and in uh, review sites, TripAdvisor and Yelp and so on. Uh, I saw an article that showed that um, of online purchasers, 98% say that they check the customer reviews before they buy. 98%? We can't get 98% of the people of the world to think that the earth is round. <laughs> but we get them piling into this information because it's so much more available and accessible than it's ever been before that that principle has risen to prominence now. Well, that brings me to another question, which is interesting, which is, you know, you wrote this book, uh, what is it, over, is it 30 years ago now or is it uh, 30 years, 30 years yeah, ago? Yeah. Um, and are you surprised at how well it's held up for 30 years? And, and uh, I mean, tell me a little bit about that. I'm stunned. <laughs> <laughs> it's sold more copies than I could have sensibly imagined at the time. Hmm. Um, and I think the reason has to do with an attempt on my part to get to human universals um, in describing the motivators that move us toward yes, the things that aren't going to change in 30 years or probably in 130 years right. because they're baked in to the way that we've evolved right. <clears throat> both as a species and as a culture. And so those things uh, are, are going to be there and, and making contact with them will still uh, make us more successful if we include them into our messages. Uh, the, it's interesting to me that the, the place that the book is currently the, uh, the most uh, recommended and uh, talked about is in digital marketing. There was no such thing as digital marketing 30 years ago. But digital marketing came along and and uh, e-commerce practitioners recognized the human of universals of influence 
apply to what they do, and they're simply um, employing and deploying those uh, those principles in, in ways that uh, lead to success there too. Interesting. Now, did the book uh, the, the the book's popularity just kind of slowly increase, or were there any like key events that happened after the book that really kind of fueled its popularity and adoption and growth? I mean, how did yeah. that go? Good question. It was it was definitely uh, some form of precipitous change. The book hardly sold at all for the first three or four years. Uh, in fact, my publisher um, said that they were going to um, cancel the contracted um, publicity funds for the for the book because that would be like throwing money down a pit wow. <laughs> to to uh, <laughs> quote them. Wow! But about three or four years later, suddenly it skyrocketed in um, sales to to bestseller levels, where it stayed ever since. And the best way I can explain it is what happened at the time, which was that evidence-based decision-making as an approach to choice in the major institutions of our society, in business, in government, in, uh, in uh, fundraising, in sport, in education, all right, took over. And the book Influence was a compendium of evidence-based information about what moves people towards success. Uh, it was a certain kind of evidence. It was scientific evidence. But nonetheless, uh, people were getting much more comfortable with that idea as well. Uh, behavioral science rather than speculations and war stories and hunches, you know, as, as a basis for deciding. So it was that, that change in the times that the book happened to be aligned with, uh, I think that's responsible for uh, what's happened to its popularity ever since. And is the popularity of the book still growing now or has things kind of leveled off? Where is it right now? Well, again, I was suggesting that it's growing now because there's a new set of practitioners right. who find that it's 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 a worthy um, set of touchstones to go to mm -hmm. when they when they want to forge uh, a, a communicative uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it happens to be um, e-marketers right now. Mm -hmm. But it, it, who knows what the next next wave mm -hmm. <laughs> will yeah, be. Right. Yeah. Oh. Now, when you first came up with these um, six principles and you started you know, talking about it, did it seem very obvious to people? Or was it like kind of like, you know, wow, we never thought about that? I mean, what was kind of the response when you first – sort of, you know, talked about these ideas? Yeah, it's a it's a good question because sometimes when I talk about them, I do platform presentations, you know, at conferences and conventions. So let's talk about something like the rule for reciprocity that says people give back to those who first give to them, mm -hmm. right? Well, there's a study done in restaurants that shows if a waiter puts a mint on the tray for each diner, his tip goes up 3.3%. If he puts two mints on the tray, his tip goes up 14.1%. Mm. People give back after they receive. Now, if you were in that audience and you you went back to your office and one of your colleagues said, so what did you learn at that conference? And you said, well, we had a lot of speakers. There was this guy, Cheltini, he was talking about influence. And he told us, for example, that people want to give back to those who give to them first. Your colleague would say to you, with this, he makes a living. <laughs> I knew that. Everybody knows that. So here's what I say from the stage, you know, to to uh, sort of inoculate people from that kind of response. If everybody knows that, how come in the great majority of restaurants there's no mint? <laughs> and if if there are mints, they tend to be at a in a basket at the door. Where as you leave, you get the mint, and no one inside the organization has benefited from the receipt. It still costs the manager the same amount of money. In fact, more, because people will take handfuls of those things. You know? 
but none of their wait staff is benefited and is, is made to want to stay more loyal to that restaurant, to stay there because their tips are good there. All right, so people understand these principles at a superficial level, but they don't understand how to employ them optimally for desired change. Now, you've just written a new book called Presuasion. Tell me about that, and does that come from influence, or tell me a little bit about that book. Well, influence was about what you put into a message in order to move people in your direction. Presuasion is about what you put into the moment before you deliver your message. Hmm. To leverage that message to greater effect. How do you attune people before they've encountered your message to the strength of it? Hmm. And is it is it structured in a similar way where you sort of have, have certain number of principles that you've also kind of boiled it down to as well? It's not. This is much more of it of a, a narrative uh, structure to this book in which I I try to outline the process by which uh, uh, the mechanism of persuasion works and give a lot of examples to try to illustrate it and um, and uh, and how to optimize it uh, should uh, a reader decide to engage in persuasion. I'll give you a, a good example. Uh, there was a study done by an online furniture store that, that specialized in sofas, and they wanted to increase the likelihood that people would choose the more comfortable and expensive models in their line because a lot of their people were choosing the lower um, uh, cost, inexpensive models. So they did a little experiment. They, they sent half of the visitors to their site to a, a landing page that in its background wallpaper depicted fluffy clouds the other half they sent to a site that in its background wallpaper depicted pennies, right? Mm. Small, small money. Mm. They found that those who went to the website with clouds then rated comfort mm. as more important in their decision making about sofas. Mm. And here's the interesting thing. They searched the site for comfort-related features of the sofas. And of course, tellingly, they preferred to purchase more comfortable models. Those who went to the site with coins rated cost as more important as a feature, mm. searched the site for price-related information, and preferred to purchase inexpensive models. Mm. And the 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 topping on all of this the uh, the cherry on the cake was, was that when they were asked afterwards what had influenced their choice not one of them recognized that the coins or the clouds had mm -hmm. made a difference mm -hmm. they said to themselves are, are you crazy i'm i'm an independent buyer. I decide based on my preferences, my internal preferences, never recognizing that what they saw first shaped, shaped their preferences in that moment. So is Persuasion, do you consider it to be sort of a really companion book to influence? Yes. Oh, interesting. It is, it is uh, what has come to be called these days a prequel <laughs> because it's what you do before you send your message. Yeah. And how did you come about – I mean how did the ideas for the persuasion come about? Did it come from all the lecturing that you've done about influence? You know, uh, there was a, a set of literature that started developing about 15 years ago that – like this study that I just described to you that didn't have anything to do with the six principles of influence. Uh, it's just where people were focused before they got to the principles of influence in a message, right, uh, that seemed to elevate the power of the message when they then encountered it. 
Um, and and there was one personal experience though that really set me off in uh, the direction of writing a book on this. Uh, there was a I, I got a. a uh, a visitor to my door uh, one day. He was um, collecting money for um, an after-school program for uh, underprivileged kids, right? Now, he didn't show me any credentials. I had never heard about this program, uh, but I wound up giving him more money than I normally give to even legitimate charity organizations. And I know why. It's what he did persuasively. He brought his seven-year-old daughter with him. And I was focused on children and children's issues and the welfare of children before he began the message. It was that focus that just like the furniture stores study, inclined me to rate children's issues more important, to, to focus on the information that he gave me regarding children's issues and to support those issues ultimately. He aligned me with his message before I encountered it by bringing his daughter was was writing persuasion more difficult or less difficult than influence or different in what way? It was more difficult because um, influence is about social psychology, and I'm a social psychologist by training. Persuasion is about cognitive psychology. What goes on in a person's consciousness mm. when they are exposed to certain kinds of cues? or imagery, um, or words for that matter, right, that attune them selectively to subsequent information. And I had to become a cognitive scientist. I had to essentially <laughs> do a mid-career um, change of focus to write this book. Now, you do a lot of public speaking as well, obviously, in addition to writing. Um, which do you enjoy more? I would say I enjoy the experience of public speaking more, but I enjoy the results of writing more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it, who was it who said this? There's a, a, a great quote. Um, he, anyway, he said, uh, this guy said, um, Someone asked him, so, do you enjoy writing? And he said, I enjoy having written. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what he means. I get it. Yeah. So what about what about going forward? Do you have ideas for other books that you want to write or you're good with what you've done so far and just sort of see what happens? Or do you actually have like other ideas that you want to write about? You know, I, I, I don't have a – a ready idea for the next book. What I have is um, an agenda for this one. We 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 already have developed a two day a workshop um, uh, on uh, that we offer to the business community uh, about how to use um, influence in an effective and ethical way uh, uh, to um, to gain assent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be developing a workshop for persuasion now um, that will also allow uh, interested individuals who want to become more influential uh, to um, to take uh, the lessons of uh, of what I've learned uh, to their everyday professional challenges. Well, Robert, it's been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your taking the time. It's a thrill to talk to the legendary author of the book, Influence. And um, I really appreciate it. if you end up do writing another yet another book, you'll definitely have to come back and tell me about it. Well, I definitely will, because I have to say, you asked great questions. They're the ones that allowed me to get into the, the core of my material. Fantastic. This is Richard Shu and Robert Cialdini. Thanks. Thanks.